Good evening, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to the Huntington. Um, it's lovely to see such a great crowd here this evening. My name is Sandy Brook, and I'm the Avery Director of the Huntington Library. Um, it's our great pleasure to be partnering for the third um, time uh, with the Book Club of California, our compatriots in San Francisco, um, on this um, Kenneth Carmiol lecture. And um, it's really grand um, to be able to host them here. Um, so, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Sharon G, who is the president of the Book Club of California. Sharon. Thank you, Sandy, and thank you, everyone, for attending tonight. The Book Club of California is one of the oldest and most influential bibliophilic organizations in America. And for over 100 years, the Book Club has been a vigorous promoter of the book and a fine printing in all its forms. In fulfilling our mission, we sponsor over 40 public programs and exhibits a year, both here in, San, both here in Pasadena and in San Francisco, and on a remarkable variety of topics. We publish limited edition books of outstanding merit, which are broadly recognized for the quality of their production and content, maintain a scholarly library of over 10,000 volumes, which is particularly rich in content from California printers, and we support scholarship on topics of interest to bibliophiles throughout, through our books and our quarterly journal, which is the only letterpress printed scholarly journal in America. I want to thank our current members for their ongoing support, um, and I'd like to thank the Huntington for partnering with us again this year and hosting this event. And now to tonight's program. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you to the third annual Kenneth Carmiel Endowed Lecture on the History of the Book Trade in California and the West. This perpetual lecture series has been made possible through the extraordinary generosity of my friend and fellow Book Club of California board member, Kenneth Carmiel. Ken is not only a respected member of the antiquarian bookselling community as the founder and president of Kenneth Carmiel Bookseller since 1976, but he has also been one of California's most active and generous supporters of academic libraries and of the bibliophilic community. Ken has established multiple endowments at his alma mater, UC Santa Barbara, and his other alma mater, UCLA, for the purchase of rare books, research, lectures, archival studies, and students, and now the Book Club of California and future scholars and bibliophiles everywhere will benefit from his generosity in establishing this perpetual lecture series. Ken, can you please stand so we can thank you for your generosity? <laughs> Thank you, Ken. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to tonight's guest lecturer, Dennis Kruska, who will speak about the lure and lore of literature on early Yosemite tourism. Yeah. Denny will explore the literary lure of tourists to the Yosemite Valley, which will provide an insight to early Yosemite ephemera, books, and lithographs. Denny is a noted authority on the Yosemite Valley and has authored a number of books on the area, including the book club's own 225th publication, James Mason Hutchings of Yosemite, a biography and bibliography. He also co-authored with Lloyd Curry the definitive bibliography of Yosemite, the Central and Southern High Sierra, and Big Trees, 1839 to 1900. Please join me in welcoming Dennis Kruska. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the elegant Rothenberg Hall. Thank you, Sharon, for the kind words. First, my appreciation goes out to Kevin Kosick, the executive director of the book club, for making sure that all the logistics of my talks went smoothly, which they have. And I want to acknowledge Ken Carmiel for endowing the series of lectures on the history of the book trade in California. 
I was quite honored when Ken asked me to present my talk to you tonight. This evening, I plan to discuss the role of early literature and publications in luring tourists to Yosemite Valley. Of course, literature and publications were not the only catalysts for Yosemite's burgeoning tourism, but in the early years, it was the primary means of getting the word about Yosemite Valley. I have added captions to most of my images on the slides, so I will not be spending much time describing them in detail as they are shown. We can understand today's legion of visitors engulfing Yosemite due to the barrage of media reports, both good and bad, social media tweets and Instagrams, and the penchant for taking selfies on overhanging cliffs. <laughs> Folks from all over the world come to enjoy a Yosemite adventure and bask in the glory of the stones. But how did Yosemite visitation evolve from 22 tourists in 1855 to over 4 million in 2018? A popular saying is that Yosemite is being loved to death. Before I start discussing the role of literature and publications in enticing tourists to Yosemite, I want to provide some background on the history of the discovery of the valley and tell the story of the first tourists to be awed by its spectacular cliffs and waterfalls. The Yosemite Valley effectively was discovered in 1851 by the Mariposa Battalion, led by Sheriff James Burney and frontiersman James Savage, who invaded the valley. The battalion's retaliatory expedition was meant to threaten or brutalize the native residents into accepting the increasing incursions of gold miners and settlers into their granite sanctuary. The raid particularly satisfied Savage's compulsion to get revenge for the Anwanichi's earlier raid on his Fresno River trading post in December of 1850. On April 23, 1851, a newspaper article published in the Alta California and written by a Judge Lewis recounted the battalion's punitive expedition against the Yosemite native people. He also described the valley as follows. The Rancheros of the Yosemites is described as being in a valley of surpassing, surpassing beauty, about 10 miles in length and one mile broad. Upon either side are high perpendicular rocks, and at each end through which the middle fork runs, deep canyons, the only accessible entrance to the valley. The forest trees, such as pine, fir, redwood, and cedar, are of immense height and size. This newspaper paragraph is the first known printed description of Yosemite Valley. Additional skirmishes with the Valley Indians took place in 1852 after two miners were killed by the native people. Regular army troops under the direction of Lieutenant Treadwell Moore retaliated by shooting six Anwanichis who were in possession of white men's clothing. On June 18, 1852, a note in the Alta California about Lieutenant Treadwell's Yosemite expedition stated, they inhabit a beautiful and fertile valley in the upper Sierra Nevada, on the fork of the Merced, known as Yosemite Valley. The valley is about 60, actually it's six, miles in length, with an average of three in breadth. The surrounding peaks are covered with perpetual snow and it is known that there is gold in the vicinity. So brief descriptions of Yosemite made Los Gold newspaper articles but the California residents of that early day, and particularly miners, had very little interest in scenery. The discovery of a rich placer certainly would have attracted attention, but mere scenery, none at all. The wonderful valley remained virtually undisturbed for three years longer. Early in the year 1855, memories of these meager newspaper descriptions of Yosemite stimulated an idea for James Mason Hutchings. Hutchings had immigrated to America from England in 1849 
seeking riches as an Argonaut in California's gold fields. For a while, he even worked as a daguerreotypist, pulling a daguerreotype wagon through the mining camps and photographing local mining scenes. But alas, Hutchings struck out finding gold, but rather discovered his riches in the publication of letter sheets, such as his fine, famous Miner's Ten Commandments shown here, used by miners as stationery to write to their families back home. Returning to 1855, Hutchings, ever the entrepreneur, was arranging for the publication of his periodical called Hutchings Illustrated California Magazine, which would promote California's unique features through stories and illustrations. So the idea of an unknown granite walled valley with towering waterfalls seemed to Hutchings like an excellent material for a forthcoming article for his pictorial magazine. In the summer of 1855, Hutchings met with friends in San Francisco to discuss a discovery trip to Yosemite. Hutchings must have been a darn good salesman since he convinced the naive party to start their trek to the mysterious Yosemite on the 5th of July. After the vagabond adventurers disembarked the steamboat in Sacramento, they rode in a stage to the end of the line in Coulterville and then continued on foot with two horses carrying supplies. Traveling along in the group was the young and talented artist, Thomas Ayers. Hutchings wrote that they were ho for the mountains. Enlisting local Indian guides and retracing the discovery route from the town of Mariposa that the Mariposa Battalion took in 1851, the weary party finally entered Yosemite Valley after a trek of nearly one month from San Francisco. When they gazed upon the marvelous valley, Hutchings later wrote, the inapprehensible, the uninterruptible profound was at last opened up before us. That first vision into its wonderful depths was to me the birth of an indescribable first love for scenic grandeur. The party spent four glorious days in the valley, exploring, sketching, and calculating the heights of the falls and the cliffs. Each day, Thomas Ayers made charcoal and pencil sketches of the outstanding features, thereby earning a place in art history as the first artist to capture Yosemite's wonders. Upon the party's return to the town of Mariposa, the editor of the Mariposa Gazette invited Hutchings to compose an article for his newspaper. Hutchings' account, printed in the issue of August 9, 1855, recorded their adventures as the first substantiated tourist party that ever explored the valley. The article was reprinted in San Francisco newspapers, igniting the torch that ever since has guided millions of tourists to Yosemite. Hutchings understood that newspaper descriptions are important for communication, but a visual verification of Yosemite's wonders would aid visitors, aid, excuse me, aid readers and skeptical Eastern folk to associate a picture with verbiage. So following his historic visit to Yosemite Valley, Hutchings hastened back to San Francisco and commissioned the production of a lithograph to introduce to the world Yosemite's wonders. The lithograph, entitled The Yohamite Falls, was based upon one of Thomas Ayer's sketches that he created during their trip to the valley. This view, shown here, is the first image of Yosemite presented for public consumption. Concurrently, many of the views Ayer's sketched while on the Yosemite trip were exhibited at McCulty's Hall in Sacramento and became an artistic sensation. Ayers' fame, unfortunately, was cut short as he died in 1858 while heading along the California coast in the schooner Laura Bevan, which sank near today's Malibu in a fierce late season storm. The four day valley exploration and publication of the View of the Falls launched Hutchings' lifetime involvement with Yosemite as a settler 
concessionaire, and publicist. Hutchings, now living in San Francisco, was busily publishing his California magazine from 1856 to 1861. Following his introduction in the first issue, Hutchings' lead article was entitled, The Ohamity Valley. Excerpts from his article read, there are but few lands that possess more of the beautiful and picturesque than California. Among the most remarkable may be classed the Yohamati Valley, surrounded as it is by lofty granite mountains and a waterfall of 2,500 feet. And he concludes, before many years have passed away, the valley will become famous as a place of resort. The article also included four illustrations of Thomas Ayers, the general view of the Hohomity Valley, the Hohomity Falls, the Twin Domes, and the Indian Lake. Word of the valley's existence reached the eastern coast as early as October 1856, when the country gentleman of Albany, New York, reprinted a San Francisco article describing the Hohomity Valley. The country gentleman introduced Yosemite spectacle to the Eastern audience for the first time. The article noted, with a certain East Coast suspicion, that if the descriptions are correct, the Yosemite Valley and its falls must rank with the most striking natural wonders of the Atlantic slope of the continent, if not superior to them. The first mention of Yosemite in an actual book occurred in 1857 in Appleton's Illustrated Handbook of American Travel. The brief article mentions that the scenery of this valley is perhaps the most remarkable in the United States and perhaps in the world. During the next few years, more tourists made the arduous trek to the Yosemite Valley, including a notable return expedition James Hutchings made with photographer Charles Weed in June of 1859. During this trip, Weed took the first photograph of Yosemite, a view of the upper and lower Yosemite Falls. In total, Weed created approximately 20 10 by 14 inch views and 40 stereo images during his visit. The frontispiece of Hutchings California Magazine of November 1859 was idealized with an was adorned with an idealized engraving of one of Weed's photos entitled Near View of the Yosemite Falls. California readers were now becoming more familiar with this mysterious place called Yosemite. Yes, Yosemite fever was catching on. In the summer of 1859, Horace Greeley, editor of the New York Tribune, visited Yosemite and remarked that the valley was truly the most amazing of nature's marvels. His notoriety, along with an article he wrote about his trip, led more credence to the valley's grandeur. Easterners would read these mind-boggling descriptions with interest, but disbelief persisted. However, from December 1860 through February 1861, Thomas Starr King, noted author and lecturer, wrote a series of articles for the Boston Evening Transcript that alerted Eastern readers to the beauties of Yosemite Valley like nothing previously published. His articles extolled Yosemite's grandeur and he likened the natural scenery to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. At the same time, Hutchings realized that a book-length description of Yosemite's attractions could be a profitable adventure. So in 1860, he published, wrote and published, Scenes of Wonder and Curiosity in California, which drew heavily upon the text and illustrations previously used in his California magazine. The book emphasized Yosemite and was reprinted in several editions through 1872 and served as one of the earliest guidebooks for the valley. Then, in late 1863, while in his early 40s, Hutchings suffered a resurgence of health problems living in damp, damp San Francisco, and he decided on a new strategy for earning his livelihood. 
He was always on the alert for business opportunities, so it's not surprising that pieces of the Yosemite puzzle began to fit together in his imagination. He decided that now is the time to develop Yosemite into a matchless tourist destination. He resolved that his new gold diggings would lie in the meadowland along the banks of the Merced River. In 1864, Hutchins persuaded his young wife Elvira, now expecting a child, and her family to accompany him to move to Yosemite Valley. After packing up considerable household goods and supplies, his family troop set out for the valley via stage and horseback. They took up residence in a primitive valley hotel and set about sprucing it up. By advertising the glories of Yosemite, he hoped to attract tourists to his property. Hutchings was determined to use Yosemite's marvels as his means to fame and fortune. Hutchings issued a series of Yosemite almanacs and trade cards to advertise his hotel enterprising. Using local resources, he also painted rocks around the valley as garish, garish advertising billboards for his hotel and other merchandise. By the way, the trade card on the lower corner shown for Hutchings Yosemite House is the earliest known trade card from Yosemite. Despite his promotional efforts, the rugged trip via primitive trails persuaded only 2,000 hardy tourists to visit the valley by the year 1868. Hutchins was not the only person trying to market Yosemite and extol its wonders. John S. Hattel compiled and published the first separate guidebook to Yosemite in the Big Tree Groves in 1868, Yosemite, Its Wonders and Its Beauties. This extremely rare book was illustrated with mounted photographic images by Edward Moybridge, issued in a small edition and never reprinted in its original format. In the late 1860s, as word about Yosemite's grandness spread, the valley was becoming a fashionable destination for more tourists from the East Coast and even Europe. Destin descriptions of their outings, often lengthy and detailed, appeared frequently in published narratives of Western travel by Eastern and European tourists. A couple more primitive hotels were established in the valley, and they published their own trade cards advertising their establishments. Here are photos of the three competing Yosemite hotels in the late 1860s. Black's Hotel started in 1869 and for 19 years served a goodly number of Yosemite tourists. In competition with Black's, also in 1869, George Lettig constructed the two-story building to become known as Lettig's Hotel. The number of excursions to Yosemite Valley continued to increase during the 1870s. Completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869 established a direct, if what somewhat rickety, connection between California scenic wonders and the pool of upper-class Easterners interested in visiting Yosemite. But the railroad terminated in Sacramento. A person living in San Francisco could travel to Yosemite in three long days after enduring a punishing and dusty stagecoach trip and then complete the last leg of the trip into the valley on an uncomfortable horse or mule ride. So 14 years after Hutchings and his cohorts walked into the valley, the final leg of the trip still required several miles of riding on a horse trail. Tourists, including many terrified Easterners and Europeans not accustomed to steep mountain trails, still frantically clung to their Yosemite-bound steeds as they descended into the valley. Yosemite was only for hardy, adventuresome visitors. But in 1871, a surprising reward awaited tourists who endured the long, bone-jarring trip to Yosemite Valley. The Cosmopolitan Bathhouse and Saloon built by John C. Smith 
offers some unexpected amenities. The Cosmopolitan featured special comforts, including fine glassware, carpeted baths, full-length mirrors, delicate bath soaps, clean towels and linens, full-size billiard tables, a barber service, a ladies' parlor, a gentleman's reading room, and even up-to-date newspapers. All of John Smith's accoutrements, including bathtubs and billiard tables, have been packed in via mule train. Imagine a happy cosmopolitan customer, able to enjoy a libation to clear the dust from their throats, a bath to wash the dirt from their hides, and maybe a go at the billiards table to make them feel somewhat civilized in wild Yosemite. Wealthy individuals and a large number of foreigners enjoy this oasis in Wonderland during its 13 years in existence. The merchants of the nearby towns such as Mariposa and Coulterville, as well as the businessmen within the valley itself, realized the need to provide better access for Yosemite visitors who would patronize their establishments and attractions. The best idea, naturally, was to construct a wagon road into Yosemite Valley. Dr. John McLean, president of the Coulterville Yosemite Turnpike Company, earned the honor of first making the Yosemite Valley accessible to wheeled vehicles. The construction project vigorously proceeded and on June 17, 1874, the Yosemite was opened to travel by stages over McLean's Road. On that day, a number of stagecoaches and freight teams passed via Coulterville into the valley. The map shown here shows the new stage roads into the Yosemite Valley. Soon, the Yosemite Turnpike and Company faced competition in July 1874, the Big Oak Flat Road was completed and likewise reached the valley floor. The new road operated to the everlasting de detriment of the Coulterville route. There was great rejoicing when the first stages rolled down the Big Oak Flat grades into the valley and all the countryside greeted the day as heralding a new era for Yosemite transportation and tourism. In 1875, the Wawona Road, a third route to the valley, was completed, and again, there was great rejoicing among the communities favored by this new service as seen in this photo. Now with the stagecoaches offering an easier mode of travel, coupled with the increased publicity from pens, brushes, and cameras of Yosemite enthusiasts, a substantial increase in the number of visitors made the journey to the valley. In the two years between 1883 and 1885, about 2,400 tourists visited the valley compared to only 653 who made the trek between the nine years between 1855 and 1864. The Yosemite tourist industry, hotel keepers, and other valley concessionaires as well as the rail and stage lines, continued to compete for the Yosemite visitor dollar. Consequently, the number of guidebooks, novels, poetry, and travelogues extolling Yosemite and the big trees proliferated. Promotional literature of the day touted the fastest and best ways to travel to the valley. Nevertheless, even with the addition of stagecoach transportation, the trip to Yosemite and a vacation for any length of time demanded hardiness, persistence, and an appetite for adventure. Scientific research also influenced a significant Sierra Nevada and Yosemite literature and ultimately more tourism. The California State Legislature established the California State Geological Survey in 1860 to collect data on the state's natural resources. During the 1860s and early 1870s, the survey group directed by state geologist Dwight, Joshua Dwight Whitney explored and mapped the range while conducting the first scientific study of the central and southern High Sierra. 
The Yosemite book, an elaborate volume illustrated with mountain, mounted photographic prints by Carrollton, Carrollton Watkins, was published by the Geological Survey in 1868 and a limited edition of 250 copies. Before this publication in 1868, Watkins' mammoth plate Yosemite photos were exhibited in the Gopo Gallery on Broadway in New York in 1862. Visitors were able to see a real representation of the much discussed valley, rather than rely on written reports or an artistic impression. The exhibit whetted the appetite for adventuresome Easterners to travel west to see the impressive valley for themselves. In 1863, California Senator John Kness is believed to have shown Watkins' Yosemite photos to President Abraham Lincoln, who was immersed in the agony of the Civil War. Impressed, Lincoln responded by granting Yosemite Valley and the Mariposa Big Trees to the state of California with the mandate that the grant be forever in the public domain. In 1869, the Geological Survey published the Yosemite Guidebook, essentially a cheaper version of the magnificent The Yosemite Book, illustrated with engravings in place of photographs. Revised editions, and especially the pocket editions of the Yosemite Guidebook, printed in 1869 through 1874, served as a convenient visitor guidebook to Yosemite. You may think it's curious that so far in my talk, there's been no mention of John Muir. Well, Muir made his first visit in Yosemite in 1868, and he took residence there the following year, working in Hutchins Sawmill. In September 1871, Two months after leaving the sawmill, Muir wrote his first article for publication on Yosemite glaciers, published in the New York Tribune. Muir's ability to cultivate his acquaintances with literary, scientific, and artistic celebrities rapidly enhanced his reputation as a naturalist. Of course, during the rest of Muir's life, he was an outspoken advocate for Yosemite and the stimulus for it being established as a national park. His nature publications helped to advance tourism to the park using his descriptive and rhapsodic writing. Muir's name is closely associated with Yosemite, but his first book in 1894, The Mountains of California, although it mentions Yosemite, dealt mostly with other features of the Sierra Nevada. I'll be sp speaking more of Muir in a few moments. In the 1880s, new stage routes linking stations along the Central Pacific Line to the San Joaquin Valley competed aggressively with each other for business. Firms such as the Great Sierra Stage Company and the Yosemite Turnpike Company established operations encompassing horses, stages, drivers, stables, barns, and way stations along the roads into Yosemite. All the businesses touted their ability to reduce travel and to ease the discomfort of the stage journey. Even with the continuing renovation, construction, and hotel improvements, Yosemite in the 1880s remained a rustic haven and a magnificent setting. Moving into the 1890s, through the tireless campaigning and efforts of John Muir, and Robert Underhill Johnson, associate editor of Century Magazine, Congress incorporated Yosemite into a much larger national park under the authority of the Department of the Interior. Then, in 1906, during John Muir and Theodore Roosevelt's famous camping trip in Yosemite, Muir convinced the president to extricate Yosemite Valley and Mariposa Grove away from California's control and return its resources to the federal government. In 1906, Roosevelt signed a bill that did precisely that. Later in 1915, Roosevelt wrote, Muir was a great factor in influencing the thought of California 
and the thought of the entire country so as to secure the preservation of these great natural phenomena. As numerous periodicals and advertising brochures like these here were churned out to lure the tourist dollar to Yosemite National Park, visitor numbers increased dramatically in 1900 to 6,500. Among the sightseers of that year were Oliver Lippincott and Edward Russell, who made the improbable arrival into the valley driving a two-cylinder, 10-horsepower locomobile. The corpulent Lippincott drove around for weeks, taking photos of attractions to promote Yosemite and the locomobile. Soon, following Lippincott's promotional locomobile outing, a Stanley steamer chugged into the valley, driven by an Arthur Holmes. In an article published in the Yosemite Tourist, Daniel Foley editorialized that the auto will soon become a prominent factor in Yosemite travel. I doubt Foley knew how clairvoyant he was. However, in 1907, a roadblock was thrown up when old motor vehicles were banned by the Park Service due to steep and narrow roads and probably a scared horse or two. After a few years hiatus, automobiles were officially admitted to the park in 1913, and in that year, 127 cars sneaked their way into the valley. However, the Department of Interior enacted strict regulations. For instance, a permit was required for each car costing $5 per day, which, when adjusted for inflation, is about $130 today. Cars could only enter Yosemite Valley from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. or 4 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. It could only leave the valley from 6 a.m. to 7.30 a.m. By 1915, horse-drawn stage transportation in the valley was completely replaced by motor stages. Returning to the year 1907, the Yosemite Valley Railroad, an independently owned spur from the main Southern Pacific line, reached El Portel, just outside the park. Although the Yosemite Valley Railroad eased transportation time to reach the valley, the railroad expressed declining in ridership over time. The train became passe and its assets were later sold off. Ultimately, the auto reigned king of transportation for Yosemite. In 1910, there were about a half million autos owned by U.S. citizens, but by 1927, there were one car for each 5.3 persons in the United States. Yosemite travel would never be the same, and the infernal combustion engine chugged into the park ever since. Park visitation increased from 15,000 in 1914 to 35,000 in 1918 to 61,000 in 1929. The 20th century welcomed new hotels and camps, such as the Awani Hotel and Camp Curry. Visitors found Yosemite's new roads and accommodations very appealing and Yosemite became an even more popular tourist destination. Auto camping became America's fastest growing sport. Immediately following World War II, war-weary Americans found rejuvenation and an inexpensive camping trip in Yosemite Sanctuary. Their enthusiasm for freedom of the outdoors brought throng throngs of visitors and their automobiles creating a crowded blight in the valley until campgrounds and camping rules were instituted around 1940. As a child, I was among this giddy group of post-war visitors. Gosh, did I love those early Yosemite family camping trips. I was driven into the valley by my parents in our old black 1940 Ford. We camped right next to the Cold Merced River, slept on old army surplus cots, and we regaled each night with calls of Elmer. Here's a photo of me during an early vacation trip 
and maybe even one of Elmer. How many of you recall screaming Elmer in the Yosemite campgrounds at night? <laughs> A few. I note that tonight's talk involved a lot of facts and figures, trying to show the evolution of a Yosemite sightseeing from 1855 on. Now I'll wrap up and discuss the current Yosemite tourism challenge. We have heard that since the time Hutchings launched Yosemite Awareness with his Yosemite lithograph, Yosemite tourism has prospered, propelled by literature, art, and Ansel Adams photography. Today, 30, excuse me, 30 years ago, 80% of Yosemite's visitors stayed overnight. Today, 80% of the visitors are day use only. On a typical hot summer day, it's not unusual to suffer a two mile auto backup at the popular park entrances. 8,000 cars and 23,000 visitors swarmed the valley, creating an automotive gridlock, which has a new term to describe it now, green lock. Visitation has skyrocketed in recent years as seen in this chart. Note that in 2018, 4,161,087 tourists visited Yosemite National Park. I can offer no solutions to Yosemite's crippling overcrowding. Newspaper articles and brochures scream about Yosemite's magnificence and the meandering Yosemite River and booming waterfalls, and they are correct. Diesel spewing tour buses clog the roads and parking spaces. Day trippers race around the valley roads trying to find a spot to park, to take a selfie, or to grab a pizza for lunch. There are many people smarter than I trying to wrestle with the Yosemite visitor crush problem, and I wish them success. Smooth highways and fast SUVs allow a visitor to reach Yosemite Valley in six hours from LA and even in less time from San Francisco. As my good friend Scott Geldman, the Yosemite Park spokesperson said, people need to understand that they are not going to get a wilderness experience in Yosemite Valley. Looking back, it's clear that Hutchins himself was cognizant of his key role as publicist of the valley and tourist enticer. In 1895, he recalled his article in the Mariposa Gazette, which described his 1855 tourist trip to Yosemite. That historic account, he reflected, was copied and republished in all the leading journals of the day and thus attracted the general attention of the public to the Yosemite Valley. It was therefore my good fortune to start this scenic and financial ball rolling, and I am entirely grateful for it. And the ball keeps on a rolling. Thank you all for your attention this evening. So we have time for some questions. Um, those of you who are familiar with this auditorium will know that if you speak up, uh, we can usually hear you, but then we'll repeat the question uh, before answering it. All right? Fine. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Ed. Do you know if uh, Jesse Benton Fremont played a role in the 1864 Yosemite Grand? Uh, I'm not really sure how much of a role she, she, she actually played in it. Um, I know that uh, Senator Kness was involved with it and everything. Probably since she was a very important figure of that day, she may have played it, but I, I don't know directly how much uh, influence she had. Yes? You mentioned early in your, in your talk that in the beginning of the 1850s there were indigenous peoples in the valley. Right. After, I think, 1852 or 3, you don't actually mention them again. 
Did, did they continue to inhabit the valley for a longer period of time? Were they all killed, or what happened? All right, the question is re with regard to the native people in Yosemite that were had the Mariposa Battalion uh, do the a punitive expedition uh, against them in 1851 and then later in 1852. Uh, after the 1852, several of them were unfortunately moved to a reservation outside the valley. And then as things cooled down a little bit and more tourists started coming in, a lot of the native people came back, but unfortunately they just had menial jobs working in the hotels. They never retained their, uh, regained their uh, glory that they had in the days when they actually lived in the valley. Um, and even to today, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, discussion about what their role should be, because there still are some uh, native um, descendants that are, are alive. But uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the white guys did a job. Yeah. Yes? Do you know what the Park Service is doing today, either electronically, tweets, uh, emails, blogs, to... Uh, slow down this rush of tourist growth? The question is, what is the Park Service doing today? I'll tell you. They're just trying to, just trying to keep their cool. Um, for a while there, they're discussing on the days when, when that limit is reached, they do send out notices that no more cars can be uh, allowed into the valley, okay? Especially on holidays like Memorial Day when it's just, it's just it's an absolute zoo. Um, there are different studies going on. You know, at one time they had considered monorails. At one time they also considered limiting how many people can be there. Um, it, it's just so many new people are discovering Yosemite that have never been there. And, I, and in my personal opinion, because I love going to Yosemite, I still go there. Uh, it's the fact that you can get there so quickly, drive around so easily, and uh, really not experience the valley, but just do a day trip in your car. Um, the Park Service certainly is aware of it, and as I said, there are people that are working on it, but I do not know what the solution will be. Yes? Yeah, uh, what's the status of the privatization of the national parks? Yosemite G1, the conflict about the Iwani Hotel losing its name. Uh, well, yeah, okay. Uh, he wants to know what the uh, status is of the privatization of the national parks. Well, good news is the Iwani and the Wohobono Hotel have their names back. <laughs> and, Camp, and Camp Curry. And, and I don't know if you had visited during the time, but how they masked those signs off were just with a plastic uh, uh, decal across the original signs. The original signs stayed there. So they finally, finally settled the, the lawsuit, which is just a horrible thing to have happened. Uh, and so the names are back. Uh, the privatization right now at, in Wawona, the town of Wawona, uh, there still are private uh, uh, houses that people own within the National Park uh, with 99-year leases. Uh, it's, it's there, and it's gonna stay there also with Yosemite West. And they kind of serve as a, a place for some people to stay when you can't stay in the valley. It's not all bad, but... Um, uh, every year, the, or every couple of years, the contracts go out for whatever company wants to take over the concessionaires, and it's big business, and that's also what helps really drive the tourists. Um, you try to get a, a motel room uh, in Yosemite Valley, and you can't because the tour buses have just seized all the accommodations. It's, it's, really, a, it's really a tough problem right now. That's my editorial. <laughs> yes. Your last slide showed a yeah, uh, the fire. The, you still want to know why the drop of, uh, of uh, tourism in the 90, uh, 94, 95 is the huge fire that they had there that uh, actually encroached into the valley all the way to the Tioga Road. And then also the, the following year, the, the fires in uh, Wawona, the Wawona area. So that's what kept it out. And it only dropped, it, I don't know, it dropped it a, a million. <laughs> so, yeah. Any more? Oh, yeah, I see. Uh-huh. Uh, she wants to know what the camp, possibility of camping. Camping is possible. Uh, you go online, and I don't know if it's one month or three months, you make your reservation online. And, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a, the deal like uh, today's the day it's going to open up at 6 o'clock. I better be online and trying to get my reservation for three months from now, or six, it might be six months from now. That's how it's done. There's very little, if any, walk-in camping anymore. It's, it's, it's just, they, they eliminated a lot of the camping spots 
uh, after some flooding that they had the, the, and uh, some, some of them wiped out and they're, we're not gonna put them back. So, but you still can do it. The best thing to do, of course, is to camp on some of the other campgrounds uh, up along the uh, Glacier Point Road or up in the high country. There you still can camp. Yes, Ted. Um, I'll just say to that last question, my wife and I were there on Sunday. Oh, you were. And there were plenty of places to camp. This is the time. <laughs> oh, yes. It's a little chilly. That's why. Yes. There were really. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, they've even gone so far now that... Uh, uh, because the parking's so bad, you can go online and reserve a parking spot. And so there's a, one parking lot that they have reserved. Unfortunately, what happened is um, people reserve those spots, but then if they found a spot sooner, they'd park in that, and, and the empty parking spots would just go uh, unsubscribed uh, uh, um, all day. So how, how, were the, how, were the, uh, how were the crowds, Ted? Okay. Uh, to see it was mm -hmm. Fall colors, yes. Maybe one more question? Do one more, okay. Actually, I have two questions. One is, I knew about uh, this peripherally, about the controversy with the name, but I didn't know why that occurred. So I was hoping you could explain it. And the second thing is, I thought that the, uh, it's been years since we've been there, but that the trams were going to kind of solve the whole problem, but people have to drive in. Reserve a place. Yeah, yeah. Her question is, uh, how did the whole fiasco with the names arrive? Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the Delaware company trademarked the names. The National Park Service didn't know that they had done it. So when they lost their con their concession to the new company, now the names stayed with them. And so the National Park had assumed to get them back, but they also had to pay several million dollars. So it was, they, they were being held in ransom. For it. But finally, they just, just, just settled. I mean, it, literally within the last few months. As for your other question about the trams, they have the trams in the valley, which is great, but you have to get into the valley and be able to put your car someplace to get on the trams. And there literally are not enough parking spots. I mean, there just, there just aren't. I mean, if you have 23,000 cars on a, on a particular day, there aren't that many paces. they don't limit how many people can come into the park right now. It's not that they let more in. 23,000 people, uh, well, 12, uh, I forget what the number, uh, thousands of cars show up, and they only try to limit it on certain holidays. So they let you in, but you can't park, and then you can ride the tram. Well, where we will let you in is to join us for coffee and cookies um, out in the courtyard. But first, please join me in thanking our speaker. Okay, thank you so much. You're certainly welcome. Is my oh, yeah. And thank you. Some beautiful images. That's my wife. My, my wife took that.